So Aaron, welcome to uh, Microsoft Research. You're here for the, the next day or so to give a distinguished lecture on some of your recent work on, um, I think, controlling or providing guidelines, uh, guardrails for uh, language generation, which yeah. is really interesting when one operates in the open world. Um, mm -hmm. You're very well known in the deep learning community, I think uh, in part because of your book that uh, you co-authored, which sits on our yeah. beautiful bookshelf there, um, with Ian Goodfellow and Yashua Bengio, entitled very descriptively, Deep Learning. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, it's a book that's really shaped, I think, the feel and brought a lot of others on. It has, mm -hmm. I looked last night, for over 14,000 citations. Yeah. But it was topped by a paper that you did uh -huh a couple of years earlier on generative ad adversarial networks. And, right. uh, also with, uh, with Ian and With Joshua. Ian and Yashua, yeah. Um, and so can you just say a little bit uh, about what, kind, wh what your affiliation is these days, how you work at, at UDM and Mila, and what kinds of problems you're, you're thinking about? Sure, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm at Mila, which is uh, mm -hmm. an institute uh, studying uh, essentially core on deep learning, but we really cover a lot of topics in machine learning in general uh -huh. and, uh, and AI sort of even more broadly. Uh -huh. um, and I'm at the uh, DIRO, that's our essentially our uh, computer science and operations research department uh -huh. at the University of Montreal. I am a I'm 100% a faculty member. I don't have any uh, sort of really cross appointments. I'm, I am actually a fellow at, uh, at Element AI, uh -huh. as well as a number of us are. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, so that's essentially my, I guess my uh, affiliations. I'm, a, I'm a, actually also a, a holder of a CCAI chair, a CIFAR right. uh, research chair. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very happy to have that. That's been uh, something that they've come out with recently to um, help the Canadian uh, AI research scene, and I think right. it's been an excellent initiative. Yeah, and in fact, one of uh, MSR's own, uh, Fernando Diaz, also right. has a CIFAR chair that uh, yeah. we were yeah, at the great. banquet celebrating those right. together. Yeah. Um, before we dive into some of your, your many projects, um, I want to just start by uh, stepping back a few decades and asking you how you got started. So uh. I know you were at University of Toronto and did your undergraduate and master's degree there yeah. in um, applied sciences and, and engineering. Right. So did you go in with a f knowledge that that's what you wanted to do, or did you drift into that? And into the, into... I mean, you even did neural network work as a... Uh, yeah, as so, so I, yeah, I guess I, you saw that. I did, I did. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, I'm the search diva. Yeah. So I, I, can, I can find things right. like your CV online. Yes, <laughs> so I guess, I mean, I, my background, yeah, so I guess I can say I did my, uh, I went through the University of Toronto yeah. in the engineering science de uh, uh, department, or I guess yeah. it's a program, engineering science program, yeah. and it's, uh, it's a really pretty uh, challenging program uh -huh. designed for people that are really interested in moving on and doing research or something a little bit like that a yeah. little later on. So it's a little bit more mathematical, a little bit more on the fundamentals of science than a typical uh -huh. engineering background. And I... I really enjoyed it. I thought it was an excellent background and, uh, and preparation for, for research uh, moving forward. The, then I, I got interested in my master's work. I uh, got interested in uh, biomedical engineering. Mm. And that's kind of where I started looking at uh, studying neurons and neural nets and these kinds of things and seeing the connection from there. Uh, yeah, and then from there I uh, went on to do my PhD work at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon University with uh, David Turetsky as my supervisor. And yeah, f and we, we got really interested in, in questions of classical conditioning and uh -huh. these kinds yeah. of things. So, yeah. So I don't did know. you go into your undergraduate degree with a, a focus on engineering or did you somehow drift into that based on... In my undergrad? No, I think I, I ver I've always wanted to do something in, along okay. the lines of science and engineering. Okay. It was ever since I could remember, this is what I love doing. Okay. So I was very focused on that. Um, it, was, it was figuring out what I wanted to do after that. The kind of, I, I also kind of knew I wanted to be a researcher, even though I, I didn't as a, even as an undergrad, I didn't really have a good idea what that what, was. What a researcher did. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I just I just love searching for things and like you know puzzling through questions uh -huh. and trying to find answers and and so I you know before I even knew what it was, I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. In terms of the specific topics, that I did a lot more sort of falling into. Okay. Um, I, like I said, the the biomedical engineering, I I I, uh, I I saw a presentation by who would become my master supervisor, Berge Bardakian, okay. and uh, he 
kind of just captivated my imagination about about the kinds of problems that that uh, we're interested in. And actually, he, he got me with a, a, a quote from Einstein, something along the lines of, you know, I want to know God's thoughts, the rest are details. <laughs> so I thought that was really impressive. And so I, yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I got into that. It, it was, I thought, really nice because it, there's a certain elegance to and, and beauty to the design in biology. And I thought studying that, if I was interested in, in engineering, I thought studying, you know, elements of design that really are very successful mm -hmm. um, seemed uh, like a, a good thing to do. So, I mean, it's I interesting that from, from a design perspective, you, you chose living organisms, which mm -hmm. are way more complex than things like bridges or skyscrapers right, in some right. ways. Um, and as you mentioned, you did your PhD at, at CMU. And one of the things I, um, I feel in, in this era is that you took actually a really interdisciplinary approach to intelligence and modeling, you know, bringing yeah. perspectives from neuroscience and computational perspectives. Right. Yeah. So, and your thesis committee kind of reflects that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it had, uh, I guess, in addition to David Turetsky, it had Peter Dion yeah, and uh, Jay McClellan. Yes, yeah. And uh, yeah. Jeff Gordon, a really rich set of, of perspectives. Yeah, they're very, I was very happy to have them all there, actually. I was, uh, each of them really contributed, uh, I felt, very much to my, the, the betterment of my thesis, and I really enjoyed having them on the, my committee. So let, let me talk a little bit about your, your thesis. Uh, during the early 2000s, you published a series of papers at, at NIPS, as, as it was called at, at the time, uh, looking at both classical and operant conditioning and trying to model temporal dynamics, trying to model similarity and, and discrimination and, right. and things like that. Um, can you tell the audience a little bit about what classical conditioning is and what it was in that uh, really low level, I guess you'd talk about it as system one kinds of processing right. that captivated yeah, so I guess what I found really interesting, and this is one of these things where I didn't know I would find this nearly as interesting uh -huh. as I ended up finding it, but um, I kind of got captured by there's there's something like a hundred years of experiments mm -hmm. by really ex excellent experimentalists right. uh, on looking at phenomena behind animal learning. And what we're talking about is the kind of very simple learning phenomena, you know, it's a very simple level. It's like Pavlovian conditioning right. where, you know, you, you uh, have a stimulus, so maybe you're ringing a bell or maybe you're having a buzzer and then you present some sort of reinforcement, either, either a foot shock or maybe you're presenting food, like a little squirt of juice or something like that, and then the animal learns a connection between these things. Yeah. So as far as it goes, that's pretty simple and we have very simple models that can describe that. But it gets much more interesting when you start, start to vary the connections between them or mm -hmm. if you have like a temporal varying pattern between right. the stimuli and the rewards. Mm -hmm. And what we found was that the, there was really, a, well, what I felt to me at the time to be a very rich pattern of what they were learning and, and I felt like we could describe it. And the only way, I, in fact, I could make any sense of it was to actually, you know, present a fairly sophisticated model of, of, of Bayesian conditioning where they were positing different hypotheses about the world. Interesting. And they would have to sort of vie between different competing hypotheses about the world okay. depending upon how much data they received. So this was a latent variable model of, yeah, exactly. of some kind? Yeah, that's right, that's right. So yeah, so the- Can you describe like one of the phenomenon that uh, you were trying to model? Right, okay, sure, that, yeah. So, so there's this interesting connection. Uh, I guess this is the only one I probably remember okay. very well at this point, but uh, there's, um, uh, let's see, uh, there's this one pattern where you can, if you shine a light, let's do light, and then you present some sort of reinforcement. Mm -hmm. And let's, call, let's say, in many of the cases I ended up studying, the reinforcement, for better or for worse, is a foot shock. So the animal <laughs> freezes, that's the kind of response. We're talking about a mouse or a rat here. So you shine a light and you present the, the, um, the reinforcement and you get a, after a while you get a freezing response. Um, then if you present the light, and then a tone mm -hmm. together without the foot shock, but you only present a few of examples of light and tone. Uh -huh. uh, then you present the tone alone, the animal will freeze, expecting the foot shock. Um, but if you present a lot more examples of light and tone and together with light and foot shock, then the animal learns eventually that the tone actually means inhibition of foot shock. Right. And so when you present so the tone. So it's learning a richer representation exactly. of the, yeah, that, exactly. that's super interesting. And then there's yeah. this, this tension between these two things where the, where the tone first becomes a predictor of foot shock mm -hmm. until eventually it becomes a predictor of inhibition of foot shock. Right. So it's not just that it predicts no foot shock, it actually predicts that a foot shock won't happen even when presented with something that normally would predict foot shock. Right. 
So it's, it's weighing those competing hypotheses against one another that we felt that, uh, well, we found that uh, a model, a, a Bayesian model actually ended up uh, describing the animal behavior very well. Okay, and so actually I, I looked last night that you won us the best student paper <laughs> award in, yeah. uh, for this work on similarity and discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's in, right. In, uh, the, it, it, does it, I asked you just a, a minute ago, does it bear any resemblance to the kind of back and forth in that you see in GANs where you have both a generator and a discriminator or were they largely yeah. disconnected yeah, in, I, in I your didn't, mind? I didn't, it didn't occur to me that there was a similarity there uh, until you mentioned it. I, I guess, yeah, I guess the, I would, I don't know, in my head they occupy very different spaces. Okay. On the one hand, they're, they're um, like we have a, just a, this Bayesian model. On the other hand, it's a very different kind of a, a, a learning process, this kind of competitive learning process right. between the generator and the discriminator. Um, so I, but they're I, tackling in some sense phenomenon that that talk both about similarity and generalizability. Yeah, in some ways. yeah, but, for yeah. sure. That's 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 very true. Okay. Yeah. Um, good. So thanks. That that was really. Uh, <laughs> it's fun to reflect. I, I hope for you on, yeah, on some it, of the the early work. Um, after you, you got your PhD, you spent several years uh, in Montreal with, with Yashua, mm -hmm. uh, and it was sort of at the, at the time when ideas around deep learning and even Mila were yeah. starting to tape sh take shape. So can you reflect a little bit on what the lab was like when you started, like who else was there, yeah. how it evolved? Uh, sure, it yeah. It must have been just this hotbed of... Uh, well, it was really interesting. So, so when I, I, f I should say that I, I, you know, I finished my PhD and yeah. we, we, my, uh, my wife and I moved to Montreal. Uh, I guess I should say my partner and I moved okay. to Montreal. <laughs> Um, and uh, because she got a job at uh, at McGill University, uh, this is Joelle Pinot, and so so I I arrived um, not having finished my thesis, so I spent uh, almost a year just writing up my thesis uh, while staying in a visitor's office at at McGill, and then um, I finished that and I sort of started looking around for what what I'm going to do next, and uh, Joshua was there and uh, he, I met with him and he was. Uh, generous enough to take me in as a, <laughs> as a postdoc. Uh, you know, I, I had not done the kind of work he was really focused on. I, I was coming out doing my, my classical conditioning modeling, uh -huh. yeah. um, but he took a chance on me and I was very thankful for that. And yeah, so, so I, I remember after having arrived, I feel like this was, you know, very shortly after I arrived, after a few months that, that I was walking by his office and uh, he kind of emerged from his office and he was saying that, you know, he was just on the phone with, with, uh, with Jeff and Jan and oh, Andrew Ng okay. and uh, they're starting a new field that's going to be called deep learning. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll remember yeah. that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, you know, didn't make, didn't, uh, make much of it at the time, but, yeah. you know, they, that's exactly what they went and did. And um, so they started really focusing on this question of representation learning yep. and, and learning deeper layered models uh -huh. and stuff like that. And of course at the time, you know, these methods didn't work very well. We didn't right. yet have the tools really to make these things trainable and, uh, and that was a series of innovations that from that time, right, yeah. from, from early, those early days where we had, you know, the, the, the only kind of method that really worked um, reasonably well in this direction was this kind of, uh, was, was this greedy wise pre-training where right. we would train layer by layer. Uh -huh. and yeah, and then from there, you know, the, the methods got better and better. But yeah, the, so, you know, uh, the kind of PhD students he had at the time uh, were, you know, Hugo Larachelle was there. Uh, later on, a little later on, we had mm -hmm. Ian Goodfellow and uh, eventually I became his, his co-supervisor. Um, but yeah, so Nicolas Leroux was around. Um, uh, Dimitri Erhan was another okay. PhD student there. So we had a, we did have a, a really good group of students in the lab, that's for sure. So yeah, I mean, some of your work from, from that period, one of them that, that really stood out to me is the work that I guess wound up eventually in JMLR, but was maybe presented at yeah. AI Stats on unsupervised pre-training. Right, right. And sort of, you know, how it, how it works. You did a lot of, uh, I guess, work on, on simulation. Yeah. And more deeply trying to, can you describe that and how it, it compares yeah. to like a probably a, a decade later yeah. some of the work that's going on in pre-training sure. now. Well, so uh, so I think I, th we were very much focused on this question of this of this layer-wise, greedy layer-wise pre-training, and kind of asking this question of why does this work? Right. And I, th that was that's a funny paper because uh, 
at least from my perspective, I don't know if Joshua would, would, uh, would agree with my perspective, but, but uh, from my perspective, it was uh, a paper that essentially came out of uh, like a, an intellectual argument between him and I as to, <laughs> as to what was the real underlying phenomenon here. Was it, was it predominantly a regularization method we right. were looking at, or was it predominantly a means of helping the, 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 um, the model optimize? And we would sort of go back and forth as which one. I, was, I think I was advocating the, the regularization strategy point of view. He was advocating the, the, uh, the optimization uh, uh -huh. point of view. Uh, and we would, in this kind of going back and forth, we would sort of design experiments to try to see which one of these would work. And, right. and that paper was essentially the outcome of that process. Uh, so so yeah. regularization then, yeah. better generalization turned out to be... Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. um, come on, take one. <laughs> yeah. it, it, well, I think that, yeah, that at the time, I think that ended up being what that kind of pre-training was. Although I will say that, that his hunch in the long term was very much right in that what we needed were models that more effective means of actually optimizing these, these models o across these many layers of representation. I see. And, I don't think we really had that at the time, but, okay. but ultimately he was very much right in that, that what was, that's exactly what was needed to make these models really perform the way that they eventually we found. How's it could. related to some of the pre-training that we see today, especially in the context of large-scale language models? And yeah, so, so it, it's, I think it's somewhat, somewhat similar in that um, we're, we're seeing the same kind of idea being used. Well, it's actually, I think it's different, right? okay. because there we really did face this issue of, of not being able to train these models end to end, um, if, these kind of deep layer yeah. models, right? So what we would do is we would train them a piece at a time, starting at the bottom as these kind of auto, uh, either an autocoder yeah. or a uh, you know, restricted Boltzmann machine right. kind of model. And then we would just stack these up on top of one another. I see, so you train them sequentially. Yes, yeah. very much. We train them sequentially in a greedy layer wise way. I've forgotten that whole era. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, yeah. And then, and then of course we would fine tune them at the end, back propagating right. through. So, so, to some, so that has stayed. Uh, but of course, if you dig down inside at what we found was that during our fine tuning phase, only very few of the top layers would actually see much in the way of adaptation. The bottom layers wouldn't really move very much. Right. Uh, so we're really relying on this, this greedy, uh, wise, uh, greedy layer-wise pre-training to do something sensible with the bottom layers there. Uh, but nowadays, the reason why you do a lot of these, in, especially for these big right. language models, the reason right. why you're doing a lot of this pre-training is because we don't really have a, so much of the same problem of, uh, as training these many layers, but there it's more of a question of, of the amount of data you have. You have okay. an enormous model, yeah. you want to be able to train these enormous set of parameters on a very large data set, and then you can fine tune that, that whole structure on a smaller task that has very right. little data, but because you've You've built this really these really useful set of features using a large data set. You can then you know adapt those models, uh, those data, those parameters a little bit uh -huh. in order to get um, a really good performance, back state of the art performance on a lot of these language modeling tasks. Yeah, um, I'll get to this a little later. I want to talk at, at, you know at the end a little bit more about uh, sort of modularity and and how one one thinks about uh, models evolving sure. over time. But um, I, I want to. So, you know, shortly after, this, it seems like you were at the center of the, the deep learning universe at, yeah. at that time. And I, I, I got to say, I, I, I think I got very, very lucky. <laughs> this this was not, yeah. yeah, this was not any great insight on my part. This is just, I happened to be there. It's literally the best I think I can say about it is I just happened to be there. Um, you know, Joshua had this vision and I thought, I think it was... Yeah, it was, um, he turned out to be very much right about that vision. But for a lot of us, I mean, it's both a, an issue of opportunity and then seizing the moment, right? You, sure. You could have been there and, uh, and done very different things. That, you know, I look back at my career, and I made a few choices about going to industry versus the university, going, coming to Microsoft about t more than 20 years ago now. And those were not particularly well planned and thought out trajectories. Um, I did have one, but it was it was not uh, what I wound up choosing. And so, in your case, it, it sounds similar. You sort of happened onto a, an amazing situation in, in Montreal, and were part yeah. of its success, and uh, continue to be t today. You're, you know, clearly a real leader at, at Mila, and um, uh, and then more broadly in the, the deep learning community. So. Uh, uh, you, Ian, and, and Yashua at some point decided to write the deep learning book. Yeah. Uh, why? <laughs> what possessed you? To well, uh, I think Yashua was approached actually by okay. MIT Press uh, about um, writing a book like this. And uh, at the time, we were thinking that um, 
Well, there, there's like reasons to write it and reasons not to write it. <laughs> a yes. reason not to write it would be that the field was evolving very quickly and it was evolving very yes. quickly then. And so we, we knew that we were going to face a certain amount of, uh, uh, well, risking a certain amount of obsolescence yeah. uh, by writing it when we did. But at the same time, there are, there is a lot of people getting into the field. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of people that had a technical background, maybe they were scientists or engineers, uh, but we're new to the field entirely, and so we, that's really who we were focused on writing this sort book Sort of the for. next generation of both practitioners and researchers? Very much, yeah, practitioners and researchers, yeah. and mainly we were looking at, at it for these people coming into the field, not necessarily for, for um, sort of first-year students, although we were writing it with them in mind as well, but um, mainly we were, that's, the, that's why we decided to write it when we did, is because we felt like there was mm -hmm. a, a tremendous demand for, for right. this kind of knowledge. And, and, just going in and reading papers can be a little bit daunting as I, in terms of knowing which papers That's to right. read and, and yeah. sort of sifting through that literature can be, um, can be a pretty daunting task. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we, f we felt like maybe despite the issue of the field not having been far from being settled, right. um, it seemed like the right time. So if, if you were to look back, it's only been four years, I guess, yeah. since the... Um, is there any of the framing that you would do different? Like, like, what's the biggest surprise? What's the biggest change that you didn't really capture in, in that book? Well, I, I, I don't know if we were, in the end, that surprised because we were writing it around the time and we were starting to see this transition. So, so bef like, pre, around, you know, just on the, while we were writing the book, <laughs> um, you know, the dominant mode in, in at least the research side yeah. of, of deep learning was very much on these uh, restricted Boltzmann machines and yeah. those kinds of methods, still yeah. very much focused on this greedy layer-wise training. Um, but we were seeing that the field was moving away from that pretty, pretty quickly. And so I think that's the part of the book that okay. I would say, uh, you know, in retrospect, maybe I would have put less emphasis on that. Because nowadays, in, at least in, if you look at the research mm -hmm. uh, being presented, um, there's there's relatively little of that in the in the you know in the research world. Um, you know, restricted Boltzmann machines are a lot less popular than they were. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, it, we were around. We were writing the book around the same time when like you know GANs were were were, were that, around yeah. and they made it in there. Uh, okay, good. Models <laughs> like variational autoencoders were around and and they made it in there. So so. A lot of the fundamentals that we're, there are still fundamentals now that are, are very much the basis of a lot of ongoing work uh, were around. So, I mean, in some sense, we got a little lucky there, too. Like, nothing has gone around and made it all completely irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I, I think that, that you're right. I mean, more and more people are training end to end mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. you know, not thinking as much maybe about the individual com components. And yeah, the, there's kind of and a... There's, there's both a, a win and a, you know, a plus and a minus to that. That's right. Because I think, uh, you know, when you train end to end, it's not clear how you transfer to a new task all that easy. That's right. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Uh, I think that's absolutely true, and uh, and I think the the we're we're now you know with work like the on the neural modular networks and things yeah. like that, people are coming back to sort of realizing that the structure actually matters inside, and and uh, and thinking about the kinds of structure that you can impose by uh, you know sub swapping in different components, right. and hopefully getting some sort of uh, generalization benefit from that process. Uh, yeah, so we're now looking at those kinds of questions. Um, yeah. yeah, good. Let, uh, let me use that as a transition to uh, to just think about some of the, the next directions in, in your work. I mean, the, the last decade has been absolutely amazing in mm -hmm. terms of the achievements uh, in deep learning, especially yeah. in uh, vision, speech, uh, language increasingly. Uh, you know, I think it, it's hard for people who experience things like search engines or uh, autocomplete, smart reply, real-time speech recognition and generation to think about the fact that it was only, you know, it's only within the last decade that systems have been getting good enough to support those kinds of interactions in the wild. Yeah. Right? These are not just static test collections. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of, of what we do you know, day to day with personal assistance, with search engines, with even sensing in cars and, and stuff uh, has really been driven by the the methods that, that you were, uh, you know, a large part of, of shaping about data and of, of compute, um, but there are also a ton of challenges that in yeah. in, in applying these. And yeah. um, I don't know. I'll rattle off a few of my my own favorite. They're, they have to do with robustness, yeah. uh, fragility in the the real world, sample 
in efficiency. <laughs> Uh, things like, and you just alluded to this, you know, grounding representations, thinking about bringing in maybe the best of symbolic and neural systems. Uh, what are some of your current research directions and how do they fit into shaping, we'll say, the next decade of, right. of systems and so, capabilities? So I guess the one of the things that we're really interested in, in, in addressing these days in my group is um, what, what I like to call systematic generalization. Okay. So this is a yeah. term that's really grown out of uh, more out of the NLP community, um, but you know it's related to notions of causality and these and okay. ideas like this, where we're interested in maybe learning uh, from a particular data distribution, uh -huh. but then being able to generalize effectively beyond that distribution. Right. And of course, what that means uh, is, is something we're still trying to formalize mm -hmm. and and make sense of because you know just generalizing to any arbitrary distribution and any pattern of, of, of mapping between your input and your output yeah. is, is, is not something that's realistic or sensible to even mm -hmm. ask for. But, but if, the, if from the training data you do have, if you can imagine learning a, a sense of uh, a set of rules mm -hmm. or, or a kind of a pattern of regularities that you can then generalize beyond that, di that right. initial distribution, that's really the kind of thing we're looking at. Okay. And what, what kinds of problems are, are you, you looking at there? Is it, it, so you know, I think about the non-stationarity of the world yeah. and it could be the same model in the same task over time. It could be generalizing to related tasks. There are lots of dimensions of, of generalizability. Right, and, so, and so we've been focused on, on this particular topic, we've been focused on um, the ki new kinds of combinations. So, so okay. the specific question, and, and we're doing this in, in fairly toyish mm -hmm. domains. Um, so looking at, for example, we, we wrote a, we, we defined this new question answering data set. Um, um, this is work with the, the first author is uh, Dima Barano. Okay. And it, what we did was we, well, we, we developed this uh, scoop data set where it's essentially very simple forms in the input. And uh, we're asking very simple questions about the spatial relationships between these elements of the input. Yeah. And you know, certain patterns were, were deliberately missing from the training set. And we would ask questions about mm -hmm. that pattern in yeah. the test set and seeing is, are these different models able to generalize to right. this okay. unique pattern that was not observed in the training set. So, and, and you know, different kinds of models performed differentially on that kind of a task. Um, and how found, do you decide what dimensions you want uh, generalization over? Is there a yeah. way to systematically explore that well, space? Well, we for this for this particular case, we're relying heavily on notions of, of compositionality. So, okay. so we want our models to recognize that the world is composed of certain elements, and yeah. that if it observes, you know, a small number of freely associating uh, com compositional elements, yeah. that it should be able to generalize to other combinations that haven't been observed. Okay. So this is the kind of generalization or systematic generalization we'd like to see uh, in natural language, yes. which we don't <laughs> currently have. Um, right. Our current models, mm -hmm. they can perform amazing on certain specific mm -hmm. tasks, but you can pretty easily make them look foolish by just changing the, the, the kinds of inputs they receive yes. uh, to something that is perfectly understandable by a human and yet very unlikely to be close to something that they've seen in their data set, mm -hmm. and they can interpret that in a, in a very wrong way. Yes, I mean, it's clear that in certainly adversarial settings, and even not in adversarial settings, you can perturb stimuli in, in small ways and have, to a human, uh, and have really huge differences for a learned system. Mm -hmm. So what is it algorithmically that, that you're doing? Is it a, I mean, is it a form of regular, regularization or priors, or how do you, think about modeling some of the, um, the ways in, in which you want to generalize? Right, so in this work, we're, we're looking more at uh, different kinds of architectures. Okay. So we're looking at, for example, these uh, neural modular networks yeah. um, that uh, came out principally of the work of uh, Jacob Andreas. Yeah. Um, and we've looked at other models. Um, there's this, uh, this Mac model that um, came out of, uh, out of um, uh, Chris Manning's group yeah. uh, at Stanford, um, and uh, then there's uh, we have this model film, uh, which is sort of all of these models were kind of uh, developed to compete on this clever data set. Yeah. So clever is is essentially a, a synthetic question answering data mm -hmm. set. So we've actually gone on. Uh, this is also work um, uh, led by uh, by Dima Barano, and we've gone on and 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 he's actually found some uh, some holes 
in Clever so we pr so that aren't actually in the Clever data set, but we can test oh, them. Oh, I see. So co specific combinations of question types, right. sub-question types. And so uh, we can actually test for this kind of systematic generalization mm -hmm. in within the Clever environment and on Clever types of questions. And uh, there we, we actually see some interesting things that, like for example, we find that our film model doesn't generalize systematically very well at all, much to my d dismay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Mac actually does a fairly decent job uh, with that kind of generalization. And we're also finding um, that certain forms of these neural modular networks actually do also a very good job. That's kind of where we're, we're seeing most of the promise actually in those kinds of modular mo models, which makes sense. It's interesting. If you go back to, to some of the work in, um, in neural modeling that happened at Bell Labs when Jan and, um, and Joshua, I guess, yeah. were, were there, uh, you know, CNNs were the real workhorse yeah. there. And, but they were not learned in a completely um, Unstructured way. There were a lot of prior. There were a lot yeah. of structural elements that were based on human physiology. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you think more and how do you think more generally about combining priors or knowledge or structure that um, we have some insights about with more uh, bottom up and inductive learning? I think there's a real art to it. And I think <laughs> I, so. So comnets, I think, are a beautiful model. They're they're one of my yeah. favorite examples of, yeah. of a of this compromise between right. the, the flexibility of, some, of allowing a model to kind of learn what it wants to learn, right. um, while at the same time adding some sort of uh, prior knowledge about right. the, the kind of domain you want to mm -hmm. apply, uh, apply it to. And uh, you can see that there's been actually quite a bit of work um, follow-on work from the commonets, trying to improve it in various ways. And I think they have yet to really have an impact on, on improving that, that structure. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, I just think uh, that's because, it, you know, the original model was very well designed in terms of that compromise, and it's been very difficult to find a, a clearly better alternative. But we've lost, we've certainly lost some of that art. Maybe they were lucky, maybe it was... Uh you know, people with understanding of the problem yeah, and the, I, the need to... Yeah, I'm not sure we, we lost it. Okay, I think, I okay. Think, <laughs> I think, we, I think m we continue to do this, right? I mean, I think it's people that go and study the, the, the details of the problem okay. that come up with things like like uh, transformer networks yeah. and things like this. So I, 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 I think we're still in this process of, of uncovering, you know, what are the best types of models to handle certain ki kinds of data. Yeah. Right. So really characterizing much better the space of applications and data and uh, need to, to generalize in, in ways that, that are really very prevalent in, you mm -hmm. know, in, in the open world. You talked earlier about your work in classical conditioning, and, e and that's a very simple low-level yeah. process, right? Very simple. And even there, there were complexities about pairings yeah. of elements, and you think about, uh, you know, kids learning language in, in right. the real world yeah. where they're looking at just this flurry of information that comes multimodally. At, uh, right. I should say, I, I should back up and say, yeah. the, the, the models, the, the, the experiments that were run and the models I used were very simple. But the, if you look at the pattern of behavior, it, it really does seem like the, the kind of cognitive tools that the uh -huh. animals are bringing to bear are actually very sophisticated. Um, I mean, we had a real hard time building models that could actually match the animal performance yeah. um, and, you know, with, uh, with whatever resources we had mm -hmm. available to us at the time in, in, in the sense of, of being able to, so if, say for example, animals seem to be able to uh, learn the specific temporal pattern of, of, right. of information and integrate that with certain amount of temporal variance in ways that it's, it would still be difficult to do that today. So I think, yeah, I, I think we're, we're still, f um, you know, it would still, I, I haven't attempted this for many years, but, <laughs> but I think it would still be a challenge to actually, you know, match the actual pattern of, of animal performance on these tasks from a modeling perspective, right? Having a single model that matched that, that, that complete pattern of, yeah. of, of uh, But there, of I mean, it's interesting because there you, the observations are in a more of a laboratory setting. Yeah. And so you don't see a lot of the rest of the world. You don't have that. That's to, right. To it's, model. it's very much That's abstracted right. away. Right. But like I said, these experimentalists, and, and again, there's like a hundred years of, 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 uh, yeah, of experimental data on this, yeah. on this topic. But, you know, they, they've gone in and are able to very precisely manipulate the, kind, the different kinds of patterns to differentiate different theories right. of, of um, the phenomena that, that they're right. studying. Are we going to need to do that for some of the deep mo learning models I to succeed? Might. Or uh... Yeah, it's a very interesting question, actually. And I think it, it wouldn't 
be too surprising to me if we if we were to get there eventually where we start considering and we're already starting to see papers along these lines, right? We're, we're studying these, these uh, deep models more as, uh, as phenomena in, in and of themselves, uh, rather than just um, sort of tools to accomplish a task. Thanks. Uh, so this has been really, for me, a fun, uh, you know, fun opportunity to hear yeah, a little too. bit more about uh, how you got where you are, the kinds of, of questions that, are, that you're using, right, looking at right now with, with students and collaborators of, of all kinds to really um, I'd say make our current understanding of deep learning models uh, more, more robust to, to make their performance in an open world, uh, in a multimodal world, one that, that blends in, in your case in particular vision and language, mm -hmm. um, a little bit more uh, stable and, and uh, predictable. Um, do you have, let, I want to close with one question, do you have any advice for students who are now getting into this field in, in terms of uh, picking problems, s what kind of background do they need to, to be successful? You had a pretty um, atypical, I'd, I'd yeah, say. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I think relatively background. atypical. Yeah. Yeah. And does that bring interesting insights? Uh, you know, where are we in the neuro uh, in the cognitive neuroscience uh, perspectives and things? Yeah. Like that? So it's an actually it's kind of interesting. I I, I would have thought that uh, w you know, that the that we we might be you know that the insights coming from cog cognitive science are, are relatively, um, well, they weren't, let's say, they weren't where they were a few, you know, a few decades ago maybe okay. in this <laughs> field. But actually in the, the talk I'll be giving uh, yeah. later today, we're actually borrowing some ideas er, from CogSci again and, okay. and, and applying them in, in, uh -huh. the, in the context of uh, AI. So, so uh, maybe not, maybe there's Can you hint about some of those ideas that, that, you'll, uh, well, there, uh, that we'll hear more about later? Yeah, <laughs> there's, uh, there's this idea that's uh, developed by somebody um, uh, by, uh, in, in the cognitive sciences, by, mainly uh, by uh, Simon Kirby on um, iterated learning. And uh, there, it's, it's essentially about how, uh, it's a theory of how language emerged mm -hmm. and how, and specifically how compositionality uh, oh, emerged in the context yeah. of language emergence. And uh, yeah, so we, we apply this um, to, uh, to essentially counter language drift in, uh, in these models. So it's, it's a bit surprising to us that it works as well as it does. So you go back and forth between some objective and... Yeah, uh, between, and bet well, yeah, without giving away uh, okay. everything, but uh, <laughs> we, we go back and forth between the, an, an interactive dialogue task and uh, which, of course, if you just were to do that by itself, there's this phenomenon called language drift that occurs. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we know about that. And so, and, but then we go back and forth between that and a kind of supervised learning. So a more standard way to do this would be just to have some fixed data set and do standard right. supervised learning on that. But instead, what we do is we actually collect data from the, from the agents that are involved in the iterative learning mm. and then train on that data. Uh, and that actually still helps to control language Interesting. Drift. So that's going to be much sparser and, and uh, well, it's, yeah, not it, sparse, I mean, less prevalent. And, and yeah, it's, 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 it's weird that it works. <laughs> okay. um, the, in a sense, the reason, well, the reason why uh, it works, we can, we can I, I won't speculate on here, but, but we see um, that, um, it has something to do with the fact that there's this kind of supervised learning bottleneck that when you transfer the knowledge from the teacher to this student, um, it, it it seems to the regularization process that comes about by that 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 learning step mm -hmm. seems to be helpful for us. Um, yeah, it's it's but it is really kind of unusual that it works. So we can get into it more maybe more later. Well, actually, for folks who uh, won't be with us this afternoon when you give. Uh, the talk, we will make it available on oh, cool. the MSR network for everybody to, to hear more about. Oh, great. Aaron, uh, so let me get back to the, the question that uh, I, I asked just a few minutes ago about advice to new students who are thinking about getting into to deep learning, both from an applications perspective as well as to provide sort of more foundational um, theory and 
Right. So I guess I mean I'm a I'm a professor, so I I, I get new students coming in all the time, and I, one one thing I can say is that it is a bit different now than it was back when I was a student. I think okay. both for uh, on the positive side, there's there's many more opportunities for students to have all kinds of of um, to play all kinds of roles. Um, back when I was a student, it was relatively rare for someone to uh, go out and actually. Main, to actually have a career in research. You, you essentially needed to become a professor somewhere for that. That was still true when I was a student. Right. Uh, unless you, you were lucky enough to get one of these, uh, a research position in industry, which was yeah. also a relatively rare thing. Right. Nowadays, um, most of my students, I think, are expecting to have a research position mm -hmm. somewhere, um, mostly in industry, because that, that, that's, as a sector, that has grown much, much larger, right. um, but also um, in, uh, sometimes in academia. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, th so, I think that's great. I think it's a much, many more opportunities are available for these students. But at the same time, I think there's there's a certain amount of anxiety for these students coming in because they, they, there's just a, it's a huge field. <laughs> the the uh, NeurIPS has grown to be like you know oh, like fourteen thousand people. I think was the last one. Is just uh, it's like when my first NeurIPS was I think maybe a thousand people. Uh -huh. So. Where was it? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, it was Breckenridge and <laughs> okay. I guess Boulder. Was that? Boulder? Yeah, Boulder. It used a lot of it. Yeah. yeah. Den Boulder Denver? Was it Denver? Was it Mike Mosher? Was yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah. I mean, it was just it's a very very different world now, and uh, and there's a certain like I said, there's a certain amount of anxiety that comes in with that. Um, but I guess my advice to them is 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 do you know follow a topic that you're interested in. Um, see it through if you can uh, to, to some sort of end and and you know it's important that you develop your own perspective on things right don't just kind of follow the whims of the day just to take time and study a problem and develop your own perspective because you know we're still very much in early stages of trying to understand these things and and you know you know yours any one of you, any one of these students yeah. uh, are going to have just as good a chance as anyone to uncover something uh, important about uh, the next the next generation of these models. You said a couple of things that I just want to end by re reflecting on. One is take your time. So I think students are often feel pressured to submit four paper, 40 papers to, yeah. to NIP, NRIPS or uh, any other conference. Um, and the second is follow your passion, mm. uh, where more and more these methods are applicable to everything we do, not just to esoteric uh, you know, research problems. Ideas can be applied to uh, climate change, to societal good. And uh, so I think there's a huge opportunity for, for students to have an impact. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. Okay, so slow down and follow your passion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I think I, I think uh, you know all advice can be can be measured, but uh, I think that that is uh, basically what uh, what I believe. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Great. Thank it's you. Pleasure <laughs> having you here. Thanks.